Schizophrenia is the topic for this video. And schizophrenia is essentially uh, defined as a psychiatric disorder where predominantly you have psychosis. And in addition, the patient will experience hallucinations and delusions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a very worrisome problem, and the prevalence is pretty high, about 1% worldwide. And it tends to be higher in uh, lower socioeconomic groups. So uh, this is an important part of the uh, uh, prevalence of schizophrenia. Most commonly, it tends to present um, in a person's early to mid 20s it might be a little higher sometimes like age 28 but for the most part early to mid 20s so why does this happen why do certain people around age 20 to 25 all of a sudden deteriorate and develop all these very worrisome psychiatric uh, uh, problems well it's involving a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And this is, of course, a very popular and common neurotransmitter that's uh, involved in brain activity. And in addition to this, it definitely has um, a genetic plus an environmental um, component with regard to etiology. Now let's talk a little bit about the symptoms. These symptoms are very important. I'll break up the symptoms into positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms you can think of as something that's adding to a person's um, uh, personality. And negative symptoms you can think of as something that's taking away from their personality. So, positive symptoms. The first one is a delusion. Now, what is a delusion? Basically, you can think of it as a patient's belief uh, of something that is very troublesome. For example, they believe that they are being uh, followed, perhaps, or they believe that they are being spied upon. And this can cause tremendous distress in their life. The next type of positive symptom that is really prevalent in uh, schizophrenia is hallucinations. Hallucinations are most commonly auditory. What that means is someone is hearing voices. And sometimes they can also be visual, seeing things. Now let's talk a little bit about negative symptoms. So I need a little bit more space. Negative symptoms or something that takes away from someone's personality. So a perfect example of that is asociality. They're no longer um, have any need to be social, so sort of withdraw from their family and friends. Another thing that is included in negative symptoms is poverty of speech, their ability to communicate effectively. Another one is anhedonia. Anhedonia basically means loss of interest in activities that used to bring them a lot of um, joy and happiness. So as you can see these are part of negative symptoms. One important thing that I wanted to mention before I get into diagnosis and treatment is suicide. About 5% which is pretty high of schizophrenia patients do commit suicide successfully and about 20% will actually attempt suicide. So it's very high. So anytime you have a patient with schizophrenia, always assess uh, the risk of suicide because it's very high. Now let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Diagnosis is really a clinical diagnosis. There's really no lab tests or that are really necessary or imaging tests that would really be cost effective. It's really just based on symptoms and history. At least one month or so, or so uh, of symptomatology. Now let's talk a little bit about treatment. 
Treatment of schizophrenia is actually very commonly tested on licensing exams. And you've got two categories of medications. You have the conventional antipsychotics, and then you have what they call second generation antipsychotics. I'll give you a couple examples of each of these. Conventional, you've got the very famous haloperidol, and then you have another one, thioridazine. For con second generation, you've got clozapine, and then another one that's common is risperidone. Now, why are there two categories? Well, these are the, by far the original ones that were used most commonly. They came out with these because these have less side effects. So that's really the reason. Now, the side effects of antipsychotic medications are very commonly tested. And I made in a, a video just about the side effects. They're known as EPS, extra pyramidal symptoms. Now these are the side effects of uh, antipsychotic medications. And I'll list uh, some of them. There's four really. There's dystonia, there's akathisia, there's Parkinsonism, and there's tardive dyskinesia. Now in this video I'm not going to go into details about these because there's a separate video that I made about extrapyramidal symptoms, but um, I will say that these are very commonly tested on the licensing exams. And also what's tested is what is the appropriate treatment if any of these do occur. So for example, for if a patient is placed on an antipsychotic medication and they develop Parkinsonism, the treatment is giving benztropine. So those type of things are definitely tested. So at this point, let's take a look at some clinical vignettes. 36-year-old man is admitted to the hospital for acute management of schizophrenia. He is a homeless man that you often see hanging around the neighborhood. He has had multiple hospitalizations over the past five years, and they occur when he stops taking his meds. He usually believes that his dead cousin speaks directly to him through fire hydrants and that she tells him that he does not need to take any medications. Unfortunately, she is the only person that he listens to. You are called to see him because you have treated him many times in the past. When you get to the floor, the nurse tells you that you should be careful when you enter the room because orders for the medication have not been written yet. You hear howling as you are talking to the nurse, and when you get to his room, you see that he is kneeling at the window, howling at the moon. He becomes angry and violent when you try to enter the room. You go back to the nurse station and tell her to give him an injection of haloperidol and diazepam, and in addition, at this time, you should. Well, this is an acute emergency, and you're giving a conventional antipsychotic so with conventional antipsychotics there is a very high probability of developing EPS so immediately you should try to uh, do something that would prevent him from developing any EPS and of the answer choices choice C talks about that Ben's troping which is usually given as an IM injection to prevent Parkinson like symptoms a lot of these other choices are not uh, appropriate in the acute uh, setting, maybe long term, but not immediately. And we have a series of questions. A 28 year old woman is brought to the clinic by a friend. She is a corporate attorney but has been missing from work on and off for the past three months. Her friends believe that she has been agitated and that her personality has changed. Prior to her absence, her performance at the office had been slipping. On exam, she appears disheveled, but is alert and oriented. The rest of the exam is normal. Which of the following conditions lightly explains the woman's symptoms? Well, it's a difficult one. It doesn't really give you a lot of information in the, in the clinical vignette. 
But basically, this is a clinical vignette talking about schizophrenia. You have a young person in their 20s, and all of a sudden, for about three months, people have been noticing absenteeism, change in personality, behavioral changes, and also her work performance has been uh, deteriorating, it's been slipping. And then she's not taking care of herself properly. So this is a classic pattern of what a schizophrenia patient will present like. Which of the following is the most important in the next step? Well, remember, always assess suicide risk. That's a very, very big thing. 5% commit it and 20% attempt it. So assessing suicide risk is very important. Which of the following is associated with this disorder? Um, approximately 5%, no, it's 1%. More common in women. Uh, it's not really more common in women. It tends to be pretty equal uh, in men and women, relatively constant. Higher levels of TSH, eh, not really. More common in lower socioeconomic groups. That is correct. Um, it's a, it's a strange thing. Either they started off in the higher socioeconomic groups and went down to a lower socioeconomic group, or they were already in a socioeconomic group that is lower when they develop schizophrenia. And then finally, which of the following neurotransmitters is intimately involved in this disease? Well, we know the answer to that is dopamine, and that would be choice D.